Cool. So, um, hey everyone. Today uh, we are going to have uh, Dan uh, Clotio uh, talk about uh, advanced search algorithms. He's done some work on uh, some stuff with uh, Monte Carlo tree search and other kind of sophisticated things. So, I think he's a good person to ask uh, about this. Uh, so, uh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So today I'm talking about search. So let's see if this works. Oh, yeah, you need to quit. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay. So, I guess up till this point in the class, outside of some dynamic programming we've covered with um, sort of structured prediction type tasks, most of our decoding has been done greedily. So you have your softmax, you pick the best word out of the softmax, and you just choose that. Um, but we probably can do better than that. Um, this doesn't really give you any look ahead into what's going on deeper into the sentence. So when you just read the decode, you might not necessarily get the best sentence. So this is where search comes in. You're going to search through your, I guess, output space and try to pick a sequence that is better than just reading the decoding. Um, and I guess it's kind of, oh, I guess I didn't make it over. As kind of a motivating example, you can imagine that you have as output of the softmax words Pittsburgh, New York, New Jersey, and everything else. And then if say Pittsburgh has a probability of 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.25, 0 0.05, so we've been pretty seen this before. But if you're just decoding one word at a time, you're going to look at Pittsburgh, and you're going to look at just New. And the probability of the two combined New York and New Jersey is greater than the probability of Pittsburgh. So you're going to generate New. Then you're probably going to generate York. So you're going to generate New York instead of Pittsburgh. Um, but if you do some sort of Search, you potentially find that one step down the line, Pittsburgh's going to have a higher probability. So it's better to pick Pittsburgh than New York and Jersey. So I guess one of the most basic search algorithms is beam search. So in beam search, you're going to maintain a beam of size n. And this means you're going to maintain the n best paths through your search space. Then at each time step, you take each path, and you do a full sort of softmax expansion of that. You take the top n paths out of the entire space of all of your expanded paths, and this is your new beam. And you sort of repeat this until you finish decoding. So you can sort of see an example here. <laughs> where this is a beam search I can handle that. Thanks. <laughs> so here we're doing a beam search of size 2 so at the first step you expand your initial state you have three states you pick the top two of those so that sentence tag has a lower score so you drop that from your beam then you expand at both A and B, and you pick the top two out of those. You sort of do this until you're done decoding. Does that make sense, everyone? Cool. Oh, that got put in the wrong place. Um, so when you're doing beam search, there's sort of a couple of potential problems. Do you have search failures? <laughs> Okay. You can have search values, for example, if your action space is significantly unbalanced. Like, let's say you're doing a shift reduce parser. If you're doing this generatively, for each shift, you need to generate a word. So you're going to have a number of shifts equal to the size of your vocabulary. And then you'll have a handful of other actions. So this action space is significantly unbalanced. And this can lead to search failures. Um, the next problem is sort of at each step, you need to expand to softmax equal to the size of your beam. So if you have a beam that's too large, like in the path, I've seen beams as large as 1,000. 
this is going to slow down your uh, decoding significantly. The next one is oftentimes the top choices in the beam will be very similar. For example, you can have, I don't know, I bought an apple, I bought the apple, stuff like this. So you're not really getting much diversity there, which limits how much you can truly improve your results. Um, the next one was a question asked in the previous class. Let's say you're doing machine translation. Your output's going to be a variable length. So outputs that are shorter are going to have higher probability than outputs that are longer, which means you're going to sort of favor shorter sentences, which isn't necessarily a good thing. You optimally want your sentences to be about the same size as, I guess, the gold standard sentences. Um, and this can sort of lead to a problem that I talked about last time, where even though you're improving model score, you could hurt your performance against an evaluation metric. So machine translation blue has a length penalty, where you want your length to be as close as possible to the target length. And if you sort of have a bias towards picking short sentences, you're going to be hurting your blue score. Um, so I'm sort of going to go through these and talk about how to solve them. So back to the dealing with disparity in actions. Um, in this case, we're doing a shift reduce parsing task, where reduce is you have open, which Um, if you look at the sort of parts here, it would open a, I guess, a, a sort of a parentheses bracket state. So let's say you had NP and idea. Open would open the first parentheses and put NP in there. Shift would move, would sort of generate a word and move that inside the parentheses. And close would close out the end of that. So at any specific time, you have actions of shifts equal to your vocab size. You have actions of open equal to the number of labels that are like, possible in your data set. Like you have NP, VP, whatever. You have that many opens. And you have close equal to the number of previously done opens. So this leads to like, a ridiculously unbalanced set of actions. You could treat shift as one action and sort of combine them all and then choose which word you do next. But in which case you're going to have at the beginning about 30 possible opens, one shift, and zero closes. Alternatively, you could sort of expand your shifts, in which case you have like 10,000 shifts. Um, so this leads to the problem illustrated here, where this is sort of going through the entire sequence and plotting the probability of doing each of these actions at the appropriate time. And because there are so many words in your vocab, the probability of shifting any specific word is very low. So if you just sort of naively run beam switch across this, it has a problem of it likes to go open, 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 open. And then it reaches whatever specific limit you have and just starts shifting crap. So the results of this are quite bad. Um, so how do we solve this? In this specific case, you can group sequences based off of the number of shifts that have already been performed. So like what you're doing is sort of forming buckets. Let's say you've performed i shifts. Then you have j actions after the i shift. You put all of these into a bucket. You move each path to the next bucket, depending on whether the next action is, is a shift or an open or whatever. So then you continue doing this until your next shift bucket has words equal to your beam size. And this sort of balances out your comparison. So you're comparing shifts against other shifts and opens against other opens. And this is one way of sort of getting around this unbalanced action probability problem. Um, they also do a cool little trick where they fast track a small amount of shifts. So like you'll take a number significantly smaller than your beam size, like say your beam size divided by 100, and you pick the top k shifts, and you immediately move those to the next bucket. So this is sort of illustrated in the next slide, where they do the normal thing, but the red nodes are chosen as the fast track nodes, and immediately added to the next bucket. Questions? Cool. What's that when they have the fast track? It's just a way of guaranteeing you have like a small number of guaranteed shifts that don't take place after too many opens. Oh. And it improves their performance. I think it's sort of like just a little trick that tends to work well in practice. Um, the next problem is, as I mentioned, if you have a large beam size, this is going to slow you down significantly. Um, sort of the better way of solving this problem is you prune your tree somehow. So you can either take your entire search tree and cut out certain nodes that don't meet a specific standard, or you can um, predict what paths to expand. So instead of taking a softmax on every single path in your beam, 
you have some sort of algorithm that tells you, take these five paths and expand them. Um, so I'll go these, to these in further detail. Now, so the first one's a threshold-based pruning, which Google Search and Translation System uses. What they do is at any given time, they take the best path score and compare that with every single other path score in the beam. And if any of them are too far below the best path score, they just cut them out of the beam. Um, so what this is basically saying is that if the path up to this point is too bad, like it doesn't matter how good the next action is, it probably can't recover. So in interest of speed, we're just gonna cut it out. Then they do the same thing um, for each node in the expanded action path at each step. So you compare the best node at each step <laughs> to every single other one. And you just sort of drop all of the ones that are a certain threshold below that. And they find, and at least in their paper, this gives them significant speed up with a minimal accuracy loss. So like, a trick like this is worth considering if you need a large beam but it's too slow. The next one is you can predict what nodes to expand. Um, so the first one is an inverse paper on generative neural processing. And what they do at each time step is they have a simple feed forward network where they feed in a bit of the action history from like the top nodes of the stack or whatever. And they just have this put an out, give you an output over the best, uh, over the entire beam. And they take the best examples from that and they just expand that. And again, as I mentioned before, because the search base is very unbalanced, they want to quickly reduce the number of opens and shifts to a more reasonable number. So like, instead of having 20 opens, you might have three opens. Instead of having 6,000 shifts, you might have like 50 shifts. And this lets them run their beam search in a much more balanced, reasonable fashion. The next one is a heuristic <coughs> backtracking paper, which we'll talk more about later. But what they do is they do a sort of an early cutoff based off of the stack at LSTN. So for each path, they run this through a separate stack at LSTN and output a Boolean true-false whether or not to continue expanding this path. And both of these, I guess, LSTMs are sort of trained separately on gold standard data where you predict the end outcome. Um, so by cutting off bad paths early, you can significantly speed up research. Questions? But just to give a concrete example, uh, if you, I gave an example, I think, in the sequence to sequence models one, where I had a translation that is, I am giving a talk, uh, or I am giving a lecture at CMU. Um, and then maybe the first two words are definitely I am. Like, there's no other way to translate that when you're doing the output. And there, you don't even need to consider any other hypothesis. But once you get to giving, there's, you know, like giving a talk, I mean, talking, uh, etc. So then you have a bunch of choices and you want to keep all of them around. So basically you say uh, anything that doesn't have a probability higher than 10 to the minus 3, you can just ignore that. Uh, it's like an absolute threshold or a threshold around the best path? At least in this paper, show the best path. It's always around the best path because otherwise you might just delete the and uh, keeping around a fixed size is often called uh, histogram pruning. So if you have a fixed size of 100, that's often called histogram-based beam search. And uh, this one is called probability-based pruning or threshold-based pruning or something like that. Also. <coughs> the sequence and like calculate the UAS score or something. Um, and then use that to turn the LSTM. Can I give you an example? So let's say, mm -hmm. let's say you're using a translation sentence and this is going to be this example. I'm going to say I am giving a talk. Um, <laughs> I, I, you want to predict the end to score. So 
you can sample the rest of the sentence and then calculate the blue score. And then you can compare that with your predicted value. Something like that. Okay. The next one I kind of mentioned already was the heuristic backtracking paper. Um, so all of the algorithms we talked about so far just sort of move forwards. Once you get to a point, there's no way of looking backwards and saying, oh wait, this decision is not a good decision. Um, so what this paper did was instead of just sort of doing a standard beam search, they would do greedy decoding till the end of the sequence. Then they would have an out, then they would look back at every single previous decision made and have a heuristic that told you which of these decisions are the most uncertain. They would take that decision, they would take the second best decision in that path, and extend that out to the end. And sort of repeat this until you get a large set of leaf nodes and choose the best one there. Um, so this one was based off of Chris Dyer's stack LSTM parser we talked about earlier. And in that paper, they found using green beam search gives them basically no improvements over greedy decoding. Their uh, greedy decoder was strong enough that beam search didn't help. But using something like this heuristic backtracking actually gave them quite a bit of a boost. Um, and I guess the algorithm they use to select which lead when they were doing the backtracking through the path to select which node is the most uncertain decision. They take the best path up until that point, and they take the current path up until the point. And they take the difference between those. Um, so what that is telling you is which path is closest to the best path, and that's sort of the most uncertain one. And at the same time, they look at the best next decision, and they add those two up. So that's looking at which path is the closest in our confidence to the best path, and then also has the best possible decision tree that we have not explored yet, and they choose that one to explore. So if we look back at all of the ones up here, beam search we've talked about already, dynamic beam search is sort of similar to the ones where you're selecting which node to expand. Um, then when we get to heuristic backtracking, you go all the way to the end, you go backwards, and you choose a different node to expand, you go all the way to the end, and sort of repeat this. Um, and this is a very nice way of, I guess, allowing yourself to look at through the end of the sequence. I suppose, and getting some information there. Then you can make a better decision about what went wrong. Cool. The next problem that I sort of mentioned was oftentimes the top end choices might not be very diverse. You might have a ton of similarity there, in which case your beam isn't really going to give you much of an improvement over greedy decoding. Um, so what we want to do is improve the top best is try to improve the top end choices. You want to make them as diverse as possible. Yeah. They will recover. They will recover. Okay. Um, so in this paper, what they do is they look among each sibling. When you expand a node, you're gonna have the best node and a bunch of its siblings. And they punish each of the siblings based off of the mutual information between that sibling and its best node. Um, so if you look at an example here, the first one, he is, and he has, has the best two examples. And those are pretty similar. So you want to get more diversity in this game. So then you're going to um, subtract a penalty based off the similarity between that and the top choice. And that puts it is over he is. He has, sorry which gives you more diversity in your being, which will hopefully improve your <laughs> Um They also did a couple of clever things when they were choosing which, when they were scoring their paths in their being. They calculated a source to target translation model, a target to source translation model, and a language model. And they combined all of those scores to score the being, as opposed to just the, I guess, that put of the softmax. I'd like to add one more thing. Uh, about when you would want diversity. So one, uh, two other times when you would want diversity are when you want to generate diverse outputs. Like let's say you want to do um, male response recommendation and you have three options that somebody can pick. 
uh, if you want to show free options to people, you don't want them to all be basically the same. You want them to be different. So that would be one place. Another time is when you're tuning your model. So when you're uh, optimizing your model based on the results of your beam search, you want lots of different things in there. So you can basically improve. Uh, you can improve your model, or you can give it alternatives that give you a better score in the end. So um, this is important if you want to do either. Um, the other way, I guess, is if you, instead of choosing the best solutions for your softmax, you sample from your softmax distribution. And um, this, that didn't work. There we go. Um, so in this case, they were doing a conversation model. And this will work a lot better in a conversation model than say machine translation. Because oftentimes, your output machine translation is going to be pretty spiky. There's going to be more words that are the, like the correct solution. But in conversation, there's a lot of different things you can say. So the output's going to be much finer. So in this case, sampling can give you a significant improvement in diversity. So I guess what they do is at each time step, they sample the top beam size number of actions from each path. And then they normalize those locally along the top D. And then they choose the best beam size out of those. Um, and so if you're in any situation where you do have a fine distribution, this can be a reasonable solution to improve diversity. And like Graham said, something like dialogue is potentially a time where you might want more diversity. Um, the next one was a question that was asked last class. And it's what do you do when you want variable instances? If you have a machine translation model, again, you do not want everything to be like a couple of words because those might still have lower probabilities than better translations. Um, so I guess the sort of simplest way, one of the first ways, was you normalize by the length. You divide it by n. So you sort of average the uh, probabilities among the length of the sequence. And this was done in Kim Young Cho's paper in 2014. Um, but this is, we can potentially do better than just averaging, I guess. So, the Google paper did something kind of complicated, where instead of averaging by the length of the sequence, they have this weird term where they do pi plus length of the sequence to some natural primary alpha over six to so the same natural primary alpha. And they just found empirically that this works better than averaging by the length of the sequence. I don't know. If you want to squeeze every last bit of performance out of your system, you can try to do something like this. If you don't, it might not be worth it. Um, they also do a cool thing where they have a coverage penalty. So in translation, you want most of your source words to be translated. Um, so they do a sum over the target sentence inside of a sum over the source sentence. And they sort of make this as a penalty just to make sure you're covering most of the words in your source sentences and you are cutting out large chunks of the sentences. Um, again, complicated might not be worth it. it. Might be if you're in a competition or something. The next one is you can try to predict the output length. Um, so in this paper, they found in their tree of sequence a uh, potential system going from Japanese to English or English to Japanese that just normalizing by the length of the sentence did not work well. So instead, they added a penalty based off of the length differences between uh, sentences. So you calculate the probability of the length of the output, source, the output sentence given the length of the source sentence. You take the log probability of that, and that's your penalty. And you calculate this using corpus statistics. So you have a corpus of a million sentences, and you calculate the probability. You build sort of a probability table of length of output sentence given length of source sentence. And you can interpolate that and use this to calculate the probability of an output sentence. And this is quite nice because it's a bit, I guess, smarter than just simply averaging. And in practice, it works quite a bit better in Japanese English than just normalizing. Although I guess Google's system works fine for them. Yeah. So I guess the next one is the beam size is a hyperparameter. So when you're trying to determine what beam size you should use, this is really something that's just done empirically. Try a bunch of different beam sizes. If your model is strong enough, just a greedy beam decoding might not give you any improvement whatsoever. In which case, like something like the heuristic backtracking might be a better solution than just, I guess, a naive beam search. Um, and 
I think most papers go from somewhere between 2 to 15, but I've seen some ridiculously large sizes like the Hudson. So run a bunch of experiments, see what works best. So this is mostly it for just coding with the search. Um, let me just go over some of the benefits and drawbacks. One of the nicest parts about Bean Search is if you already have an existing decoding model, it's really easy to add Bean Search to the end of it. And this will just give you a boost of points. Um, so a lot of papers that are published at conferences will do this just to make their system more competitive. So this is definitely something to consider using for your final project. Um, it's also guaranteed to not decrease the model score. So like the probability, for example, of using perplexity. Beam search will always improve your perplexity. Or at least make it constant if the greedy search truly is the best beam search. And if that's not the case, you know something as well. So you can debug your beam search because it's broken. Um, drawbacks, as I mentioned before, larger beam sizes are slower. If it's too much slower, but you're still getting a lot of improvement for larger beam sizes, consider printing it some sort of speed it up. And then you're going to have to make a decision based off of like <coughs> speed and improvements, how aggressive you're going to print to be. Um, this is something to do and look at the results. It will not always improve the evaluation metric that as Grant mentioned last time, where in translation, as you increase the beam size, the sentences were getting progressively shorter. Which, if you looked at the, um, I should have included the graphic, but if you looked at the graphic from last time, they had a normalized score and a normalized score, and the normalized score got very fast, but the normalized score also sort of peaked and then plateaued off. So it wasn't really worth increasing your beam size too aggressively. And the final one is, there's sort of are a bunch of variations on beam search. So depending on how complicated you want to make your life, there's going to be a bit of hyperparameter tuning, but this is where all that works. There's a lot of hyperparameter tuning anyways. So this is just sort of an interesting side note. So there have been a couple of papers about using beam search in training. So when you're decoding a beam search, you're sort of decoding off of a path that your model has already seen. Um, and this is not how you train your model. So perhaps if you train the model the same way you decode, you're going to get better results. Um, so I guess the possible solution to that is try to find a way of training with the search. This presents a problem where your, K, your KR max is not differentiable. Um, so you need to find some way to work around this, some way to get a differential direction. Um, how many people here have heard of Lasso? Cool, that's most of the class. Um, so the paper here uses a method very similar to Lasso, where they run their beam search and they compare their goal of standard answer to all the elements in the beam. And then if it's outside of a certain margin, they will accumulate loss based off of that. Um, so if you look at the graphic here, I guess this is sort of using the margin three-ish, and whenever the goal answer drops below the margin, they're going to add that to their loss function. Um, then, when they do backpropagation, they still do the sort of gold standard backpropagation, but they also have their margin-based backpropagation based off of the points where it drops below the margin. Um, so that lets them train using sort of a lasso-esque margin-like beam search. Um, <coughs> I guess one thing to note is when they're expanding after, their initial expansion is just sort of standard beam search, but once it drops out of the margin, they add the gold standard back into the beam for the next expansion. Um, just something to note. The next paper is instead of trying to do a margin base, I guess training, they, this is Kartik's paper, I don't know Kartik. Um, he does a relaxation of the K argmax to make a sort of a continuous differential pair of max. Um, so this is sort of standard. The point to concentrate on here is this two parts of it, where you'll, for example, if you have your, this is a beam size of two. So if you take the top two results, what you'll do, hmm, what you'll do next is you will compare them. Actually, do you want to cover this graph? <laughs> I'm a bit less certain about this one. Sure, sure. Sorry. So, so basically the idea, um, maybe writing on the board would be easier, but um, if we have a whole bunch of hypotheses, we have a big vector full of hypotheses, 
um, each of these hypotheses has a score, right? Um, and out of this, we could take the k argmax and get one hot vectors, where our first uh, our first vector has one on the number one best uh, hypothesis, and our second vector has a one on the uh, on the second best hypothesis. And then if we multiply this by the embedding vector. Um, then we could get something that has uh, embeddings for the um, best two, that has embeddings for the best two hypotheses and kind of input them into the, um, input them into the model. So in beam search, we have to do, we have to take the K argmax of all of our hypotheses and input the K best uh, things into the model in order to do beam search. That's like the definition of beam, beam search. And we could do it in this way, but doing it in this way is not differentiable. Um, we can't backprop through it. But what we'd like to do is we'd like to come up with a, a version of this that is differentiable so we can do backpropagation through, uh, through this. And the way it works is basically um, we create a soft version of the K argmax. And the way we do this is we note that each of these will have a score. Maybe this is 7.2. Uh, maybe this is 6.9. Um, so then we take the k max. K max is um, is a differentiable or sub differentiable operation. So uh, this is okay. And then given the k max, we calculate a similarity function between 7.2 and all of the elements in here. And if the similarity is higher, you get a higher score. And then you run a soft max over that. So then um, Basically, we get a soft version of the k argmax, where maybe uh, this is 0 0.9, this is 0 0.1, this is 0 0.05. Then down here it's 0 0.9, uh, or 0 0.85, 0 0.07, etc. So basically, in each of these columns, the for the first column, the one best column will have the highest probability or the, the one best, the first best hypothesis will have the highest probability. In the second column, the second best hypothesis will have the highest probability, uh, et cetera. And um, you can look at the equations in the paper, but basically the idea is if we make the k argmax uh, a soft k argmax, then we can back propagate through beam search. And, uh, and it works and gives better accuracy. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Yeah. So, I guess that's mostly it for beam search. Does anyone have any questions about beam search or any of the specific just little tricks that we covered? I, I have a general question. I think I, um, <coughs> you I saw a project similar to heuristic back tracking in last year's class. Is that same as paper? Back tracking with Jacob. When, when you say last year's class, you want to say things from machine Yeah, I think it's the same. Uh, some of this overlaps with uh, with stuff that I talked about. Yeah. Is Jacob Buckman that same? He was he was a super Okay. Cool. Any other questions? So then, other than dividing by size, So that's where I did talk a bit about the predicting the. Predicting the output length is used for that, where they were adding a penalty based off of the difference. So, any other questions? Oh. Oh, when you use the lasso to, 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 to mimic the, the beam search, does that mimic it? Like is the regularizer mimicking the beam size, or why does it mimic the beam search? Like a non-lasso? 
So it's a <coughs> different than with regression is, uh, is the social, right? So it's, it's not Lasso exactly. It was just inspired by Lasso. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so because yeah. Because it's cross-text. Yeah, sorry about that. I wasn't clear about that. Yeah. So this is inspired by Lasso. It's sort of Lasso-esque, but it's not Lasso. So they were just running a beam search of size of n, and they're taking the margin based off of the goal and what's in the beam. Sort of heuristic. Ish, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, if you say it's lasso, it's like. <laughs> yeah, I think it's white lasso, that's a whole lot of fun. Anything else? So we're going to go on to the next section, which is <coughs> HDAR-based algorithms. And for most of these that I've seen, they're used in parsing. So it's still going to be a lot of parsing, and maybe a little bit of MD. Um, so I guess the basic idea behind a star search is you're still maintaining a set of paths, but you pick the next path to expand based off of the total cost up until that point as a heuristic estimate of the cost from that point to the goal. And then you pick the one of those that has the highest score. Um, so, I guess one way to look at it is the original score is the cost of the score to the current point plus the estimated score to the goal. And there's a couple of important things to note here about the heuristic function. So, you want the heuristic function to always underestimate. I hope I'm getting this right. Um, or not overestimate? I can never remember which way it is. <coughs> so the cost, it should not, it should not underestimate the cost. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you also want to be consistent because most of the time you're working with the closed search base. So here this means if you have two, if you have your probability distributions, you want them to be monotonic. So you don't want to take a couple more steps down the path and have the probability go from decreasing to suddenly increasing again. Um, and as long as you have both of these, uh, A star will hopefully find the, uh, I guess it's guaranteed to find the shortest path to your target. Um, so one of the initial A star, I'm just going to cover it on the non neural network pressures, because a lot of neural network pressures are based on this one. Um, did you cover this in Taylor's class? I didn't think that Taylor was <coughs> teaching it. Did you start searching Taylor's class? Yes or no? He mentioned it, but I didn't know the details. OK, I'll go over the details then. Um, so what you do is you have what's called an inside hitter B score, which is your score up until the current point, uh, your G. And you have an outside hitter B score. And this outside hitter B score is your heuristic. And what this means specifically is this is sort of a bottom-up <coughs> probabilistic context-free grammar version of um, So you're going to have build up constituents. And inside that constituent, that's your inside cost. That's the cost to get to the current point. And your outside cost is you can think of this as the, the score of integrating this into the rest of the tree. Um, and oftentimes, this can be estimated by summing up the uh, inside costs for all of the tree outside of your current span. Um, and they use sort of this to guide their A star search. Um, when we get this to neural network land, this is used in all the time CCG parsing. Have you seen CCG parsing? I'm also not sure about this. Actually, can I, uh, I add one more thing first? Um, yeah. uh, we have a really good example on the board. So, um, if you're not familiar with A star search, one of the reasons why A star search is good is it tells you how much more am I going to have to pay to translate to finish the rest of my actions. And in this case of Pittsburgh, New York, and New Jersey, if you look at Pittsburgh, um, let's say I, the sentence is I live in Pittsburgh, you can kind of guess once you say Pittsburgh, you're done translating. You won't have to do anything more. So basically, your heuristic could be something like zero. Um, but if you translate new, um, if you output new, then basically you know you need another word. You might not know which other word you're going to need, but you know, hey, I'm not finished yet. 
and I'm going to have to pay at least a little bit of a penalty to add in extra work. So if this is the case, maybe the, the probability of these is, low, um, is higher for New York, um, or for new, but for the word new, I, I guess together these have a probability of 0 0.55 and 0 0.4. But you also have your heuristic here, and your heuristic would say something like uh, 0 0.01, so I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to have to pay any more penalty to do this. Um, but, uh, but here, oh, sorry. We're doing this, probabilities are hard. So um, let's not do probabilities, so let's do log probabilities. So the log probability of 0 0.4, what's log 0 0.4? Anybody? Anybody have their computer open and type log 0 0.4 into it? <laughs> Uh, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll call it negative 1.5, and then this is negative 1. Point, uh, negative 1.2 or something. So the score for this is better, but then we have a heuristic of negative 0 0.1 versus a heuristic of negative 1. So we know we're going to have to pay a bigger penalty, and we, think, and we know that penalty is going to be like at least 1. So if that's the case, then we sum these together, and we get negative 1.6 <laughs> and negative 2.2. And we instead decide to choose, uh, decide to choose Pittsburgh instead of uh, New York. It's our next thing to expand. So the idea is we want to know how much more we're going to have to pay in the future based on our current decision. And for inside, outside, you're looking at the score of the inside thing, but then you're guessing the score that you're going to have to have to parse the rest of the sentence is the general idea. Um, hopefully that, that gives a concrete example. Yeah, thanks. Any questions about that? Cool. So I guess for CCG grammars, um, it's just a type of parsing. Look up here, you just forget the idea of how it's building up the sentences. They tend to use, um, I guess, the super tags. So like they're they're coarser tags as opposed to your some what you're normally used to, and this gives you a smaller set to work with, which makes a star more tractable. Um, and then you build up sequences along the sentence. Um, so for parsing, you can sort of take your LSTM. And you can use this to encode your current span. Then you can use this to encode everything outside of your current span. You can sum up all of the scores for both of those. And that sort of gives you an inside score and an outside score. So you can use this to guide your search. Um, so this part is hopefully pretty simple. But the question here is, is your heuristic admissible? And it, like, it's not necessarily admissible because you're just sort of naively summing up the inside scores for everything outside of your current inside. Um, so to, in order to make this more similar to a admissible heuristic, what they do is they use a tree LSTM to encode everything on the outside. Um, and this should give you a better idea that's hopefully closer to being admissible. It'll give you a better score for the rest of your tree, and a better score what it's going to cost, what the score will be in the future. Um, so we've covered tree LSTMs before, and I think they use the same one, one of the ones that we've covered, to encode everything else. Um, also, one thing to note is tree LSTMs are quite a bit slower than just running a standard LSTM. So they use sort of a pruning-esque algorithm that we've talked about, where um, you first evaluate G of n, then you expand all of the best scores of G and n to calculate H of n for those. And you use that to stop a bit earlier. So if some of your G of n's are too bad, you don't bother calculating outside for them because it's just too time consuming. Um, yeah. Questions about this one? Then this is sort of going to the question that you asked, where um, you want to estimate the future cost. 
so in this case, it isn't necessarily like a true A star search, but what they do is you have your encoder and then you have your decoder. At the same time, you can help have an alternate, what they call a soothsayer network, which is using the Python AQ function to try to predict your future cost from this point. Um, and they put, they sort of combine both of those for the decoding time encoder, and then they'll add the output of their Q network, the functions, to their, I guess, normal encoder output for choosing how to um, And when you're building this Q network, you can add sort of other things. For example, if you do a translation, you can predict the output length of the sentence and sort of use this to guide your sentence. And I think they train this in a similar fashion where you sample outputs and then you predict from intermediate steps what the final step is. And you use the d difference between the final outcome and your predicted outcome to train that to say network. Um, and this is sort of, they're not really doing a star search, but it's very a star because they're, you have to be heuristic that's predicting the cost of your current nodes to the final output. So, so that, that's completely right. I just wanted to add one more thing about this paper, or well, two more things. So A star search, the heuristic has to be admissible, which means it can never underestimate the cost of decoding the entire rest of the sequence. If it underestimates the cost, you can get search errors. And A star search is, because your heuristic cannot underestimate the cost, um, you, uh, you cannot get, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Over, 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 oh, over, yeah, sorry, overestimate the cost. Yes, you're right. Okay. Because if you underestimate the cost, then you, then you pick something that you shouldn't be. If you overestimate the cost, then you expand too many things. Okay, right, sorry, overestimate the cost. Thank you. Um, so it cannot overestimate the cost. And because it cannot overestimate the cost, that also means you have to work really hard to design it. Um, and for something like a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, it's basically impossible to design an admissible heuristic. So what you do is you say, it'd be nice to have an admissible heuristic, but it's impossible. So we're just going to create something called a future cost, which is like a heuristic, but it's not admissible. Um, and then we use that to guide our search. And then hopefully that will make our necessary beam size smaller. One other thing about this paper is this paper is a little bit confusing because it conflates two problems. It conflates modeling problems and search problems. So as I mentioned last time, um, modeling problems occur when your model score is better, but your final evaluation is worse. Um, search problems happen when you didn't find the hypothesis with the best model score. Um, this is kind of handling both problems in the same thing. So it's not only doing, it's not only adding a feature cost, it's also defining something that's not trying to predict your model score, but it's trying to predict other things as well, like the, like the sentence length or the blue score or whatever. So um, in a way, this is kind of like a future cost. In a way, it's also kind of like something, something else. But um, it, it's a nice paper anyway, so I think uh, you, you should take a look if you're interested in search. So, I guess with they star search, um, if you can create an admissible heuristic, you have nice guarantees that you're going to find the best model score, which you don't necessarily get with a good search. And they have gotten very strong results in stuff like CCG pricing. Um, as drawbacks, you can't necessarily just like take your existing model and throw a search on the end. You can't just throw a search onto the end. You're going to need to put in a bit more work trying to design a good heuristic. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much answer search. I'm not sure if I've really seen it used that much outside of parsing, but stuff like the previous paper, which is, I guess, A star search inspired, has been used in areas like machine translation and could be worth trying. Well, there's also a bunch of other search algorithms that I'm gonna quickly go over. Um, one of them is particle filters. So particle filters are similar to a beam search, but instead of just having a beam size of N, you're going to let your beam vary based off of how certain you are. So for example, if you do have a translation sentence that starts with the word I, you're going to be very certain that the translation is I. 
you have a very small beam size. But if you're trying to translate a word, you're less certain about you want your beam size to be larger at this point. So this works by you have a set of k equal particles. And then you divide your particles up to the current constituent, like the current paths, based off of the probability of those paths. So higher probability paths will have more particles, lower probability paths will have less particles, and anything under one is just wrong. Um, so this leads to something where if you have a couple of high probability paths, they're going to get all the particles. But if you have a much flatter distribution, you're going to have a lot of particles spread over a lot more paths. Um, so, and then each time you expand it, you take all of the paths in the current, I guess, beam as it were, expand all of those, then reallocate the particles along the expanded ones. And this is very nice because it does give you sort of a dream thing, but with a much more elegant solution <laughs> in this comparing it to a threshold. Um, so in this specific case, this was used for a generative dependency person, and they also went into the same problem I mentioned earlier, where when you have generative shifts, you get a problem with the imbalance in your action space. So again, they compared after the same number of shifts. So you have a shift, and you take an arbitrary number of actions that aren't shifts until you get to your next shift, at which point you would add it to the beam and do the particle rebalancing. Oh. So this is pretty similar to beam search, but it is nice if you want a pruning-esque solution without actually pruning. Yeah, and also, I guess one, one connection to make, this is sampling for the particles, right? Um, um, in, in particle focus, usually. If I, I don't think this one. Oh, okay. So nor normally where you do particle filters, I think you just sample, you basically just sample 20, 20 or so paths. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, may maybe I'm wrong and you can just ignore that. But what I was going to say if I were right, uh, <laughs> was I, I thought this was kind of like the sampling based version of, uh, of dynamic beam search where you prune based on a threshold. Um, but I'm, I'm not super confident now, so I won't say that. You might be right. Mm. Yeah, I'll make a note on Piazza or something and look it up afterwards. Okay. Um, how do you call the part of the to this side? So you take your top end probabilities, you take the low end probabilities, and you distribute them over time. So, for example, let's say you have a beam of, let's say you have your sort of action space. Um, you would take the particles and distribute them based off of the probabilities. So like, let's say you had um, actions with, let's go back to this example. You had 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and everything else. And you had 100 particles. So you would give Pittsburgh 40 particles. You'd give New York 30 particles like this. Make my particles here. Then when you have it across, I guess, multiple paths in the beam, you're just going to have to normalize the probabilities to get the overall probability distribution. So if I were to drop a plot, that's going to be a lot of stuff. Any other questions about this? OK. The next one's not really search, but I think it kind of falls under search because some of the search papers were specifically referencing this. Um, where if you have multiple models, you can use one of them to re-rank the outputs of the first one. I guess a classical example of this in classical MC systems, oftentimes you would start to use 100 <laughs> outputs of your target sentences. Then you use a language model in your target language to re-rank those best off of the language model and choose the best one. Um, you can do something similar with neural models. So for example, if you have a generative parser, as I talked about before, decoding with generative parsers is kind of tricky. But oftentimes, generative parsers have features that the um, discriminative ones don't have. So what you can do is you can create a top 100 best list or whatever from your discriminative parser. You can rescore all of those with a generative parser and sort those. And they found that this does better than generating with your discriminative parser than re-ranking with, a, I guess, a separately trained but same discriminative parser. So this is sort of like ensembling where you can ensemble two models that are the same but trained with different parameters. You can have two of the same model, discriminative model, trained with different parameters. Generate, I guess, four of them, then re-rank them, and that feels worse than re-ranking with a generative model. Um, 
So that is one other solution. Then the last one, which hasn't been wildly used, but I'm a fan of, is you can do Monte Carlo research. Where with Monte Carlo research, what you're doing is you are, um, I guess you have your tree of partially completed paths. You choose one of those paths, and then you do a rollout where you randomly sample from based off of the sophomore until the end of the node. <laughs> and you back up that score to every single node along that path. Um, then when you're choosing which node to expand, you sort of have an exploration exploitation trade-off where you want to explore new nodes, but at the same time, you don't want to be exploring nodes that are bad. You don't want to be exploring nodes that aren't going to get you a good score. Um, so you have this, I guess, I guess there's an ECB one in this paper, where you calculate the trade-off based off of how many times this node has been visited versus what's the overall score in this node. And it will give you a nice balance between exploring and sort of exploiting good nodes. And in this case, we use it to generate um, natural language. Uh, I think one thing to note is in a lot of these, they were with generative models. And I think that's because searching in generative models is going to be slightly more complicated. You're going to have problems like the action and balance, which means you want to be using more complex search algorithms beyond just throwing on a beam search. Um, <coughs> I think that's pretty much it. So we're a bit early. Does anyone have any questions about any of this? I think um, my my personal my personal view is that you should you should do beam search uh, like in almost any model you're going to do you're going to get a few points by doing beam search uh, so uh, it, it's a good thing to add to your model if you want to get good uh, results it, as long as it's a structured prediction model of course if you're not doing structured prediction you don't care at all uh, about search but um, if you're doing structured prediction, you will need some sort of search algorithm. Um, <coughs> something like future costs are very are very attractive because we can probably predict them very uh, accurately with uh, neural networks because we have LSTMs that can look at the whole rest of the sequence. So um, I, I think that would be something very good to integrate into your model, but it will be significantly harder than just doing beam search. So if you're doing something like a generative model uh, that has big search problems, then something like uh, a future cost would also be very good. Um, a star is very difficult because you need an admissible heuristic. And for neural models with infinite context, it's extremely difficult to come up with an admissible heuristic. So um, the CCG parsing paper is one very good example of how to do that, but it's uh, um, not easy to do. For the example of like the future cost search um, that uses the neural method to predict it, do they do anything to the cost to like um, penalize like inadmissible um, sort of predictions more than otherwise? Uh, no, I think they just predict the amount of model score until the end of the sentence. Um, so it's not, they're not doing anything tricky like that. Um, the, the CCG parsing paper is doing something a little bit tricky. So it has a local model. Uh, and in the local model, you can do stuff like dynamic programming, which allows you to calculate a heuristic function efficiently. And then their global model is a model that conditions on everything. But that global model can only penalize, can only penalize the local model, which means the local model will never We'll never overestimate. <laughs> yeah, the local the local model will never overestimate, which is uh, which is what you want for the heuristic function. So um, that one they did they did something tricky and they got it to work. So if you want to do a star search, then you'll have to do something. You'll probably have to do something like where you have something that you can calculate efficiently. Then you have something more complicated that only penalizes the thing that you can calculate efficiently. Um, to add on to that, they also had to use super tags instead of normal tags to allow the dynamic search to be tractable. Uh -huh. So like they were already doing extra stuff on top of that to make the search problem more tractable. Yeah.
So it's a be it's a beautiful paper, but it's not super easy. Yeah. Um, anything else? What's the recommended trick to make it a mean search differentiable? Is that the Maxwell thing you were talking about, or is the other? Oh, so the other method is not differentiable. It's um, it's a way to define a loss function, but it's um, it's a little bit dif different than like actually differentiating, uh, di uh, act actually um, calculating the derivatives through beam search. Um, I, I think they're both good. Um, they're both good methods. Uh, we didn't compare uh, the two, which uh, it would be better if we had done that. But, um, So I, I don't know. So. I guess there's one final one. I already mentioned, definitely use something like a simple beam search. If you're using structural prediction for your final project, it will improve your results. It's worth doing. If you don't get any improvement, try something like linguistic, like backtracking. That can give you improvement where, where your beam search isn't helping very much. But don't necessarily worry about the more complicated models. That's not the focus of the paper. Yeah. Sort of related question, uh, similar to the blue button process local. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense to use the same thing in computed backdrop to uh, maybe constrain the individual subsequences? Um, I I don't know the details of what you're what you're proposing, but um, it it sounds interesting. If you <laughs> if you were doing if you were doing truncated backdrop with an objective other than likelihood, like uh, like blue score or uh, whatever ASR accuracy or something, then maybe maybe yes, but I, I don't uh, I don't know exactly what that would look like. So. Okay, um, I, I think we'll uh, wrap up. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.